Welcome to the Planet Ready Podcast, where we bring preparedness to where people are. You see, it doesn't matter who you are or where you live. Everyone faces unique risks and vulnerabilities to their future. Our job is to make sure you're prepared for any situation, whether it's a man-made hazard, a natural disaster, or even assuring your finances are in order. On this podcast, we get exclusive insights and inside stories from disaster survivors, world leaders, and experts from diverse backgrounds and fields of study. The conversations that we'll have focus on reaching the 99%. That includes families, friends, and even our neighbors, and especially those who haven't thought twice about readiness. Don't miss out on a single episode. We're bringing you everything you need to prepare yourself and your loved ones. So without further ado, let's begin. This week on the Planet Ready Podcast, we'd like to introduce to you our special guest, David Ware, who's going to share his story to inspire and encourage our listeners to get hashtag ready for it. You see, in this episode, we're going to hear how David learned from the Grenfell Tower fire disaster and how it thrusted him into the world of fire safety and preparedness training. You see, fire safety is a huge issue, and it isn't going away. As a matter of fact, a southern Taiwan high-rise fire took the lives of 46 people and left dozens hospitalized back in October. David can especially attest to the fact that building construction issues also play a big part and that residents need to prepare alongside servicing agencies who must address these issues as well. Let's go ahead and bring in our guest. David Ware has over 15 years of experience in the fire service and 20 years in developing and producing training courses for many industries, including emergency services around the world. He has a first class honors degree in fire engineering and is a fellow of the Institution of Fire Engineers. He's a respected guest speaker and is on the IFE International General Assembly and the RICS Fire Safety Working Group. And we're happy to finally have him on. How are you doing today, David? I'm fantastic. Thank you very much. Yeah, really good. Awesome. Awesome. Let's go ahead and dive right into it. So, David, can you tell us a little bit about a disaster that impacted your life and what did you take from the experience? Well, as you mentioned, it was the Grenfell Tower fire back in 2017. And I remember when I woke up and saw the video footage, I remember looking at it and thought, which country, you know, which country is this from? And when I realized it's in the UK, I'll be quite honest, I couldn't believe it. Because obviously I've always thought our standards are the highest in the world. Mm-hmm. And I also remember looking at that and thinking those poor residents, how, how horrendous that would have been, you know, being trapped in that building. Since then, I've spoken to firefighters when I was in London. I spoke to firefighters that actually went into the building and they gave me some stories. And again, you know, it really impacted me what they what they found. And also I was in the fire service myself for years. And I'm, you know, kind of telling people out there that those firefighters that entered that building, I really believe that they must have thought when they went in, they were going to die. Mm. You know, that is not the sort of fire that fire services can actually deal with. It was that bad when they went in. Uh, And and to to give an impact on how much it affected me, I was in in a cinema watching a movie. and And in the movie, the outside of the building caught fire and it was spreading up and everyone had to go on the roof. And all these people were trapped in this burning building. And in the movie, I couldn't stop crying. And my wife was going, we can stop crying. It's, you know, it's only in film. But I remember those people at Grenfell. And you know, I've got wife and kids myself. And yeah, it really kind of got to me that did because of how bad it was. Yeah, that's uh, had a real big impact on me that has. The Grenfell Tower Fire. Yeah, it's it's it, it must have come as quite a shock to you. I mean, just thinking about how you first reacted to the news when you first heard it and about how you didn't even know something like this could happen to you. I mean, it kind of plays into the psychology that we all deal with every single day. It's like, we don't know whether or not it's going to happen to us or whether it can even really happen to us because we think we're all prepared and that we're in our own little world and that, oh, this could never happen to me, but disasters could impact anyone at any day, at any point of uh, any certain time. So It, it really there's 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 really that uh, psychological aspect there and uh, how much it can wreak havoc on people's lives. So uh, I, I completely understand them. So how exactly has this impacted your life moving forward? Well, at the time of the Grenfell, after that, I said to myself, well, I'm a consultant, I'm a trainer. I've got access to e-learning. Right. I'm going to educate, you know, provide education. And the big thing was it's not just in the UK. I wanted to give it to everyone, you know, around other countries. So a big thing for me was because I I believe education is a key component for the emergency services entering the buildings, for the designers and building, but also the residents. 
So my my going forward, really, I thought, well, I'll I'll do free videos and as much as I reasonably can, and every conference I speak to, I say it exactly as it is, you know, to prevent this happening again, to be honest with you. And it's oh. particularly poorer nations that don't have access to the training, you know. So that's why but the great thing is with the internet, you know, they have. So that's how I'm that's what my kind of goal is going forward. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's trying to get that information out there as soon as possible, and especially to people who need it, you know, because there are yes. a lot of people who may have readily available access to some training courses or guys that could help them, you know, um, learn how to prepare for disastrous situations. But there are people who don't have anything at all. Yes, you know? there so are. I think that the more prepared we are globally is, you know, as uh, the more we the more we're prepared globally, it doesn't matter, you know, what ladder of it, does, it doesn't matter what part of the ladder that you're on. The fact that we can all have access to this information so that we can all be globally, globally pre- prepared to reduce the amount of uh, uh, to reduce the amount of casualties in any particular type of situation is is uh, is is that's something that we definitely need. And it's positive and encouraging to hear about you trying your best to get that information out there, you know, to people who need it. So I thank you very much for that. Um, so what do you think? Uh, so how did your experience personally motivate you and inspire you to get communities prepared? Well, really, it's because in my industry, and I appreciate, I know, I will say no, there's that many buildings in the, around the world that have got similar pl- products on. You know, I know they are. The, the, that is the problem, is the combustible cladding on the outside of these buildings. And I know there's a lot of buildings that have got this, and there'll be, there will be more disasters. I think there will be more incidents. Like you mentioned Taiwan, where 46 people died. That was three weeks ago. That's kind of there, because I think what it is, I don't want other countries to wait till they have their own disaster before they react or impact on it. That's what I think. I think there's a, you know, there's a real problem out there with buildings that are potentially going to do the same thing. So I'm motivated to, to kind of do whatever I can reasonably based on the fact that I think other incidents like this will occur. Exactly. It will occur. Exactly. It's, it's knowing and understanding that there are some issues that some people might not even be aware of that may contribute to disastrous situations. And so you have to help people become yeah, aware. Yeah, they have to be aware that they might be in a building they think is safe, and it isn't. I'm not trying to frighten everybody out there, but mm-hmm. they do need to appreciate that their building, they might think it is, but it might, might not be, you know. Exactly. So when something does happen, they've got to take it seriously, yeah. Exactly. All things taken into consideration. Exactly. So what do you personally think is one of the biggest misconceptions about fire safety? And what do you think a lot of people should take into consideration regarding that? Well, actually, it's relating to something that I have pushed for years. And I, by the way, I do not sell sprinklers. It's about fire sprinklers. The biggest mm. misconception is people believe that when one sprinkler goes off, they all go off. Mm. So they think in a block of flats, if it's sprinklered, if it's a fire or flat, all the sprinklers in the building are going to go off. And that's a big misconception. It? The only one that goes off is the one where the fire is. Now, mm. it's, you know, that's and that's because, you know, and it goes off. And that, the problem is residents are reluctant sometimes to have sprinklers because they believe that because of the movies. Mm-hmm. You know, in the movies, all the films, don't they? One goes off, they all go off. And I think people believe that. I want people, if they've got the chance of getting sprinklers installed in their buildings, to kind of jump at it. Because sprinklers do save lives, and it's kind of a, a fact that people don't die in sprinkler buildings. America, mm. you've got a lot of sprinklers. You sprinkler nearly everywhere, but it's a good thing. And I want the residents to realise that. There's a lot of misconception. So you know, burn the toast, the sprinkler goes off. No, it doesn't. Sprinklers are heat detectors. They're not smoke. De- they're not the smoke detectors. They're not sprinklers. They're not smoke detectors. They're heat detectors. So that's kind of one big misconception about sprinklers. And I want to quell that myth. And also another one is kind of people say people die in fires because they panic. Well, no, no, they don't die in fires because they panic. Most people die because they don't react. You mm. know, to fire alarms going off. Mm. I mean, only recently now in the UK, they're starting to put fire alarms in the common areas of blocks of flats so that they can set an alarm if they needed to. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I was aware of one in London and they set the alarm off in a block of flats. It was a false, it was just a test, see a fire drill. The problem is no one came out. Mm. And I thought, what mm. happens if that was a real fire? And these are exactly. residents. This was after Grenfell. And I thought, guys, if they're going to put alarms in and you're going to ignore them. And they interviewed them afterwards. And they said, why did you not go out? They said, oh, but we thought it was a false alarm. Wow. You know what I mean? And you can't. Now, if fire alarm goes off anywhere, 
Mm-hmm. Don't, don't treat it as a false alarm. Get mm-hmm. out. Yeah. And, and that's, that was a real fire drill they did. And uh, no one came out. They all stayed in the flat. And that was after Grenfell. So a bit of a shock, really. Yeah, you know, I now you have me thinking about that a lot because there are times where I'm in my apartment complex and, you know, a fire alarm will go off and I'm thinking to myself, eh, it's probably not as bad as, you know, it, 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 it's probably not, it, maybe it's just a false alarm, you know, maybe somebody just has yeah, some that, smoke going it. into <laughs> their detector or whatever it is. And there's no way I'm going to leave all my belongings behind. I'm just going <laughs> to stay here. And if, if things get serious and I start seeing fire outside of somebody's window, then I'll start packing up all my stuff. You know, that's kind of like the running psychology. It's like, well, I don't want to. That's wanna... the problem there. That's the yeah. problem. It's too late. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. And, you... yeah. and as soon as the situation gets too dangerous, it's like, okay, now, now not only have you probably lost all of your things, but you're putting your life in jeopardy too. Yeah. So yeah. it really sucks. And and I definitely, um, I, I completely understand that, you know, it has to get to a point where we have to start taking uh, some of these situations very seriously, like whether or not it's, you know, even a false alarm, we, we need to be able to, you know, uh, take the necessary actions to ensure the safety of ourselves and those around us. So yes, yeah, we do. 100%. We do. Exactly. So um, what kind of innovation do you think is needed to reduce the risk and mobile preparedness in neighborhoods across the nation? Right. Well, that's innovation. I think it's already there. And, you know, for me, it's the World Wide Web. You know, it's we need to utilize it more mm-hmm. to provide that everyone's got them. phones everywhere, haven't they? You know, in the poorer countries have all got iPhones. And phone. I think we've got to utilize the World Wide Web. And, and there are a lot of organizations doing that. And I think that's what we need to utilize that more. Because I think, like you say, making sure all the emergency services are prepared for dealing with incidents, but not just... Normally, you know, the, the, like normally blocks of flats, like you say, when your block of flats, if there's a fire, you will have to leave because most of them are confined to the block. That's what they're designed for. Mm-hmm. Normally, 60 minute fire resistance, you say, but it's only when it goes up the outside of the bill or something like that, then you've got to be prepared. But the sort of the emergency services, and that's why I was working with the Leicester Fire and Rescue Service. They had a brilliant procedure, and I was really impressed by it because it was flexible for dealing with high rise. So Mm -hmm. I worked with the fire service and created uh, some e-learning courses for emergency services on how to deal with with these, but also flexible. So if the fire is up the outside of the building, what how can react to that? And and we want to get that out there, really. You know, Mm -hmm. we want to get that that message out there to emergency services. Firstly, how to deal with them to incidents that potentially are like Grenfell. And we've also translated it, by the way, into different languages as well to give access to people that obviously, you know, don't speak English. So. Oh, wonderful. We hope wonderful. it works. You know, wonderful. We hope it works. Do you think that social media is a big part of the equation as well? Because I think a lot about how I use social media nowadays for spin global and how I'm trying to find new and creative, you know, unique ways to try to capture the attention of people and try to bring to their attention that preparedness is an extremely important aspect of our lives. And that you know, nowadays, even emergency management agencies are taking social media a lot yeah, more seriously yeah, yeah. because they realize how easy it is to spread the information. But, you know, yeah. obviously there are also some, you know, cons as well. Sometimes people not, might not receive the right types of information or, you know, there, there may be just uh, mis- purposefully misleading information out there. But how important do you think is social pe- social media is a part of that equation? Well, I think it is. And I remember actually, I remember a, was it a course once, the fire service, and they said, they actually listen out for media because if people go see a fire before they ring the fire brigade, they get on the phone and they're filming it. You mm. know, they're actually on social media streaming the fire. That's before they call the fire service to say they see the fire. So actually, the fire service might be might be informed of a fire on social media before mm. they get a phone call, which mm. is amazing, really, you know, because people are so used to phones out there and taping all this. And, and yeah, they're, they're filming it. So I think it's it, it's got a good way of getting the message out because people are, you know, always on the phones, aren't they now? They're always on social media. So, yeah, they should put, you know, it's like this sort of podcast. What a great idea to hopefully get that message out there. And the same with other messages, you know, to get, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, social media. It's, it's, it's insane to think about how much control it actually has over our lives nowadays. Yes, I mean, the first is impulse it? is to yeah. just get your phone out and start recording a fire <laughs> or someone drowning yeah. or whatever it is. Yeah. It's like, it, it's crazy how that's deeply embedded, like in our psychology now. It, it, and there's tons of research behind this, but it's just insane when you really think about it. And you just yeah. hope that, you know, people continue 
uh, using it as they move forward for, you know, obviously the benefit of mankind, you know, using it in the yeah, right yeah, ways. Dude, you know? yeah. So that's really important. That's really important. So uh, given our current moment, you know, uh, with a pandemic still at play and with seasonal hazards rearing their heads, what final thoughts would you like to offer to our listeners? Well, I suppose we've been this pandemic and like you say, you don't seem to be going away, it just seems to be calming down a bit. It, it, being in a pandemic don't reduce the number of fires. What it does is it means you're more likely to be at home because a lot more people are exactly. home. So yeah. if there's an incident in the high-rise residential block, you're more likely to be at home. I mean, really, just residents of high-rise buildings need to know what their procedures are. You know, do they actually find out what I, is it stay put? Is it is it evacuate? What's the what's the what's the evacuation? And advice like get smoke alarms in your flat for yourself if there's a fire when you're asleep. Keep exits clear, you know, and that's in your flat and not put things in the corridor because it's blocking your escape route. But it's also putting fuel in the corridor that it's not designed to be there. It's not designed to be there. And make sure a big thing as well with flats is the self-close. You know, if your front door will have a self-closing device. Mm. So if you run it, you close your door behind it, it just shut, shuts itself, self-closing devices. Making sure that their self-closers are working. Don't mm. take them off. People tamper with them. And, you know, that means if you run out and there's a fire, your door's left open and the fire gets in the corridor for everybody else. So that's for high rise. But you mentioned seasonal wildfires. The frequency and the yes. intensity is getting worse and worse. My sister, she lives in Sydney and she's in Bundina. She lives in a wildfire prone area. And the big thing she knows now is to be prepared. You know, they push a lot on this. Be prepared. Make sure your phone's charged. Make sure you're listening now. But be ready to go. Don't wait. And like you said, then don't say, if they say go, go. It's mm -hmm. possessions, not your life. Exactly. Don't die trying to save possessions. Get your pets, get your kids, and get out. You know, and, you know, as you said, we've done videos on that as well. You know, we just want, we, I just want to do a bit of what I can in my industry, you know, and, and I put it on my courses and put them on the web and, you know, free for everybody to just kind of educate them, really. Something makes you feel good, if you know what I mean. It makes you feel good that you're hoping to, to help. And I'm in a position to do that. So that's my final thoughts, really. You know, education is key in my mind. Yeah, definitely, definitely. I think that, you know, the more communities learn to come together and work together and to become more prepared as a whole, it, you know, kind of creates this, um, this, this cascading effect where everybody kind of jumps in and starts doing the same. And it makes for a much more responsible, you know, community and, and, and a much safer community as well. So completely in the end with the e-courses, keep on doing what you're doing. I feel like social media and just, you know, online media app, media applications, I feel like it makes for much easier spread of information. And given that, you know, in some countries nowadays, people have easier access to, you know, technology of source, you know, at, uh, when you, you know, oppose that with other resources, which is pretty insane when you think about it, because, you know, the fact that some people have easier access to, te to technology rather than food and stuff like that. Since, but the fact that the information is there and it's readily available for a lot of people and the fact that we have great people like you who are, you know, putting out this information so that, you know, people who are from the far reaches of society can finally receive this and have access to information they've never had for their entire life and possibly even the generation before them. It, it, you know, makes for a much safer world. So thank you so much on that front. Really appreciate it. No All right. So uh, before we conclude this podcast, we have a special game that we want to play with you. We want okay. to go ahead and jump to jump into our Planet Ready Up trivia segment. This is an opportunity to put our guests like you in the hot seat and find out how much you really know. We ask you a series of questions related to your field of knowledge. Now, if you get it right, that's good on you. But if you get it wrong, well, you have the chance to convince our audience otherwise. So are you ready to play? <laughs> yep. Go on. Awesome. Awesome. All right. So here's your first question. There are five types of common fire hazards in the UK and dust is one of them. True or false? Dust explosions. Yeah. Dust explosions. Yes, it is true. All right. Dust. Wow. Angel delight. If you get angel delight and throw it in the air, put a match in it, it'll blow up. Wow. Dust is explodable. Wow. Big, big explosion. Sugar. Yeah. Flour. All explodable. Correct. All right. Answer locked in. And that is true. That's the correct answer. Awesome job. Wow. And, you know, now that I think of it, I, 
I mean, I didn't know what type of dust that I was thinking of before. <laughs> Anything, <laughs> angel, do you yeah. like sugar? Not sugar, not sh not the particles. It's got to be fine, but all dust, yeah, right. really, is explosive. Wow. Bad stuff, yeah. Don't do it though, won't it? Don't go and do it. <laughs> <laughs> got you, got you, one hundred percent. Here's the second question: True or false? A CO two fire extinguisher, a CO two extinguisher, is the most suitable extinguisher for an electrical fire. Correct. There's bullet that or powder, yeah, it is. That's what it's designed for mainly. That's what you get in, in the offices and places like that. CO2 extinguishers are designed for electrical. Yeah. Great, great. Answer locked in, and you are correct. That's true. Exactly. Wow. <laughs> we're just running through all of these. Awesome job. You know, if you were back in school <laughs> right now. <laughs> that's right. Well, the worst thing is the easier the question. I certainly don't want to get it wrong. That's the point. <laughs> exactly. The easier the question, exactly. you're thinking. Yeah. Exactly. Where is your final question? Let's let's you know, let's hope your uh, chance is still really high here. <laughs> let's not jinx it for you. The last question is true or false? The primary causes of fires in the UK are arson. That is true to my knowledge. That is true. That's what I tell people. That's in commercial premises. Arson is the most common cause of fire in commercial premises. Yes, that is true for arson commercial. Interesting. That's really specific. Um, based on the information that I looked up online, I found this, um, I found this question to be false. Uh, it has a lot more. All oh, right. Well, fault. in commercial, it is arson uh -huh. is the most common. It used to be smoking, you know, thing, but arson is the most common in the commercial sector. Apart from that, really, I suppose. Yeah. yeah. So, okay. okay. In the commercial, that's like industry. That's common, the most common cause of fire. Yeah, it's dreadful, really. But uh, interesting, interesting. Yeah. Um, what do you think about faulty appliances and leads when you juxtapose the two? Uh. Well, in houses, it'll be in residential properties. It will be uh, damaged electrical equipment, things like that. Yeah, mm. that won't be arson, but it's the commercial sector. It's this. Yeah. Got you. Got you. Interesting. And great specificity. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I mean, heck, I'll give that one to you. Or I'll just let the audience make their decision on that one. <laughs> <laughs> but awesome job. Awesome job. Great job. Great job. Thank you so much for joining me in this, David, this episode, David. I really appreciate it. Really appreciate your input. And hopefully we have the chance to have you back on. Thank you very much indeed for your time. Mm -hmm. So that's it for this episode, everyone. We want to give a special thanks to our guest for joining us today. And if you'd like to find out more about David Ware, you can visit his LinkedIn at David Ware. And you can also contact him at inquiries at frconline.co.uk. He'd be delighted to hear from emergency service organizations around the world to discuss assisting them and preparing for disasters. And don't forget to check out planetready.com, a premier online disaster risk reduction and emergency preparedness platform for individuals, families, houses of worship, businesses, and governments, where we bring disaster preparedness to where people are. I also want to give a special thanks to our audience for tuning in today, because these episodes would not be possible without you. So we want to thank you all so much for tuning in, and we can't wait for you to join us in our next episode. But in the meantime, we hope you get ready for it. You've been listening to the Planet Ready Podcast, proudly brought to you by Spin Global, a public benefit corporation that exists to disrupt disasters from neighborhoods to nations. Do you have questions or a topic you'd like us to explore? You can reach us at podcast at spinglobal.org. Make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel at Planet Ready by Spin Global. Don't forget to visit planetready.com and prepare yourself and your community on the world's premier online disaster risk reduction and emergency preparedness platform.